Hello. In this next series of videos, I want to return to the subject of the frequency responses of circuits and introduce a standard way of categorizing and analyzing these frequency responses. And that is using the techniques of poles and zeros. In this first video, I'm just going to have a look at what we mean by a frequency response and revise some of the material that we've seen already. In particular, we'll do a couple of examples and see how we can generate the amplitude and phase responses from the frequency response. As a quick reminder, the amplitude response is an equation that gives you the gain of the circuit as a function of frequency. And it's the amplitude gain, the magnitude of the output voltage divided by the magnitude of the input voltage. The phase response is an equation that tells you the difference in phase between the output signal and the input signal, again as a function of frequency. The frequency response is a complex function which returns a complex number, which is a function of frequency. The magnitude of that complex number gives you the amplitude response, and the argument of that complex number gives you the phase response. I'll be using frequencies both in radians per second and in hertz in these talks. So again, a quick reminder, whenever I write F, I mean a frequency in hertz. Whenever I write a omega, a small Greek omega, I mean a frequency in radians per second. At DC, the evaluation of gain is very straightforward. The gain is just the output voltage divided by the input voltage. So we can simply write the output voltage equals G, a constant real number, times the input voltage. With AC signals, and again, I'm only thinking of sinusoidally varying AC signals here, we can use the, the technique of phasor analysis and write both the output voltage and the input voltage waveforms in terms of their phasor representations. And if we do that, we can define a complex gain, which is the ratio of the output phasor to the input phasor. And then we can write that the output phasor is the complex gain times the input phasor. Now, we can write the output phasor in terms of its magnitude and its phase angle. And that just gives us the magnitude of the output times e to the j, the phase of the output, and the input phasor in terms of its magnitude and phase angle. Magnitude j theta in is the magnitude and the argument, the phase angle of the input phasor. As a quick reminder, a phasor of this form with a magnitude of v out and an angle of theta out represents a sinusoidally varying oscillation of magnitude v out times cosine omega t plus theta out. That's how you go from a real oscillation to the phasor representation. Now, the gain is a complex number. It's the ratio of the output phasor to the input phasor. And I can represent the gain as the magnitude of the gain and the phase of the gain, just like I can with any complex number. Bit of rearranging of this formula, and we get the magnitude of v out times e to the j, the phase of the v out, equals the magnitude of g times the magnitude of v in times e to the j, and using the property of exponentials that e to the power of x times e to the power of y is e to the power of x plus y, that would give me e to the power of j, the phase angle of the gain, plus the phase angle of the input phasor. Now, if these complex numbers are going to be equal, then their magnitudes must be equal and their phases must be equal. So I could write that the magnitude of the output is the magnitude of the gain here times the magnitude of the input, and the phase of the output 
is the phase of the gain plus the phase of the input. And this is how we separate out the amplitude response from the phase response. From these two equations, we can just see that the amplitude response, which is the magnitude of the gain as a function of frequency, is just the magnitude of the output phaser divided by the magnitude of the input phaser. And the phase response, theta g, is just the phase of the output minus the phase of the input. So this is the amplitude response, this is the phase response, and this, just g, is the frequency response. And all of them are functions of frequency. We'll have another look at an example we've seen before, this simple RC circuit. You can analyze it just as a potential divider, and you can get the gain, which I'm going to write as h of omega. It's a function of frequency. It's the ratio of the output phaser to the input phaser is 1 over 1 plus j omega rc. If I want the amplitude response, I have to determine the magnitude of this complex expression. Now, whenever I have a complex number, which is the ratio of two complex numbers, like this, I can most easily work out the magnitude by converting both the numerator and the denominator here into their polar form. And if I do that, the polar form of 1, that's just the real number 1, that would be 1 times e to the j 0, which I'll probably just write as 1 from now on. 1 plus j omega rc, however, that is a complex number with a real component of 1 and an imaginary component of omega rc. So it would be up there on the argand diagram if this is the imaginary axis and this is the real axis. The real part is 1. The imaginary part is omega rc. So the magnitude of the denominator, this term here, is just the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle which is the square root of 1 plus omega rc, all squared. And the phase angle, this angle here, that is the arctangent of omega rc over 1, which I'll just write as a tan omega rc. So I could write this in denominator in terms of a polar representation, magnitude here, e to the power of j, a tan omega rc. Now, I have two complex numbers in polar form, and I want their ratio. The ratio of the magnitudes is easy. That's just 1 over square root of 1 plus omega rc squared. The ratio of the phase terms. Well, I can use the useful property of exponents that x to the power of a over x to the power of b is x to the power of a minus b. And therefore, the phase term of this expression is going to be e to the power of naught minus the arctangent of omega rc, which is just minus a tan omega rc, not forgetting the j. So I've got this formula now, this frequency response, in terms of its magnitude, 1 plus omega rc all squared, and that is the amplitude response, and e to the power of j minus a tan omega rc, and that is the phase response. For simple circuits, like the previous one, this process isn't too difficult. But it rapidly becomes more complicated when we get to more complex circuits. Even this one, which only has two resistors and two capacitors in it, rapidly gets out of hand. We've done the derivation of this frequency response before, uh, so I won't repeat it here. 
But what I would like to look at is converting this frequency response into the amplitude response and the phase response. Again, the best way to do that when I've got an expression here, which is the ratio of two complex expressions, is to express the numerator and the denominator both in polar form. So, the numerator, we've seen how to do that before. If you think about an argon diagram again, the numerator would be somewhere around there, where the real part of this complex number is 1, and the imaginary component of the complex number is omega, in this case, R2C2. So that is the magnitude, and that is the phase angle of the complex number, and we could express the numerator as square root of 1 plus omega R2 C2, all squared, times e to the power of j, the arc tangent of omega R2 C2. Now the denominator. The denominator has a term in j omega squared, which makes it a little bit trickier to identify the real and imaginary parts of the denominator. We have to note that j omega squared is j squared omega squared. In other words, it's just minus omega squared. So I could rewrite the denominator as 1 minus omega squared, in this case r1, r2, c1, c2, plus j of omega and then all the terms that have a factor of j omega in them. That is the real component. This is the imaginary component. So now, if I was to plot this on an argon diagram, I would have a point there, which had a real component given by this expression here, and an imaginary component given by this expression here. But I can apply Pythagoras and trigonometry in this right angle triangle in exactly the same way, and write my denominator as the square root of 1 minus omega squared r1 r2 c1 c2 all squared plus omega squared r1 c1 plus r1 c2 r2 c2 squared. That's just the amplitude of this complex number from Pythagoras in this right angle triangle. And the phase term will be the arctangent of the ratio of the imaginary to the real components. So that would be e to the power of j times the arctangent of omega r1 c1 plus r1 c2 plus r2 c2 divided by 1 minus omega squared r1 r2 c1 c2. And that allows us, now that we have both the numerator and the denominator in polar form, to convert the entire frequency response into polar form, and then we could work out the amplitude and the phase responses. The amplitude response would be the square root of 1 plus omega r2 c2 all squared over the square root of, well, it's all this lot, and the phase term would be e to the power of j, the arc tangent of omega r2 c2, minus the arc tangent of all this lot. I'm not even going to bother to write all of this out, because it's just going to be horrendous. We're going to get a very complicated expression for our amplitude response and a very complicated expression for our phase response. And this is for a comparatively simple circuit. We really desperately need a simpler way to describe the amplitude and phase responses of these circuits. And that's exactly what poles and zeros allow us to do. Next time, we'll take another look at this example and extract a common form that we can use to develop a general approach for all circuits.